worship. Dear walls between us, by the cross you came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us, by your grace we are no longer bound, no longer bound. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking, all the dead are coming back to life, back to life. Hear the song awaken, all creation singing, we're alive, cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive cause you're alive. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive, and what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is greater Let's give him praise this morning Amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close no thing can compare you're our living hope your presence Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory, God, is what our hearts long for To be overcome by your presence,
ask you to pour your Holy Spirit into this place today. God, we welcome you here, God. We open our hearts for the words that you have for us today, God. We praise you, God, for bringing us all here and all together. What an exciting day it is for us, God. But if you're not in it, it means nothing. So God, come to us today. Speak to us. Speak through Pastor Shane, God. Speak through these these words of this next song, God, and help us to just feel your presence here today, God, and be ready to move when you tell us so. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Lift your voices together. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Working in this place, I worship you, I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are aren't you glad you are here touching every heart i worship you i worship you you are I worship you, I worship you, you are here, turning lives around, I worship you, I worship you.
Fellowship both online and in person. We understand that during this time when we are physically distanced, it can be very difficult to feel connected to one another. However, we would love to connect with you. We invite you to go to the link below, which will take you to our online connect card. Here you can share a little information about yourself. You can also use this link to share prayer requests and decisions that you make during the service. For those that call CLF home, Ways for you to continue to give to support the ministry of CLF can be found on the screen. Online giving can also be found on our website. You can follow along with today's sermon and scriptures on the screen or in the YouVersion Bible app. After downloading the app, click More, Events, CLF to follow along. We are so excited that you have joined us today and we look forward to connecting with you. Good morning. Good to see all the people out today. That's awesome. Uh, this morning is an exciting day for CLF, right? And, and first of all, that was a great, great worship, right? I mean, that was awesome. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, they deserve a round of applause for that. That was awesome. But today, we, uh, we're excited as we, uh, um, it's been close to a year, and this morning we are going to uh, present a recommendation for pastor this morning. And uh, we've come to know them for many months now. It's, uh, and uh, he's got a great name, by the way. Um, Shane Carr uh, from uh, Pikeville. And, got, and I said this last week, but uh, he's got a middle son named Micah. And somebody else has that too. Uh, so, um, but that's not the reason we chose him. We, uh, that's not the reason we chose him. But anyway, uh, we are so excited um, and so this morning, without further ado, I'll give you Mr. Shane Carr. Hello. Well, this is starting off swimmingly. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, if you don't mind. Father, just thank you so much for allowing us to gather here today. Lord, many right now have heavy needs. Lord, many are, are, are suffering with broken hearts this morning. and We lift those prayer requests up to you that, uh, that we've been gathering through the week and those that we hold in our heart now. Lord, right now we ask that you bind the enemy uh, from this room and the rooms of those that are listening in. Fill it with your presence. May it be your word spoken today and not mine. Lord, may we, may we worship you in a way that is honoring to you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, again, my name is Shane Carr. And uh, as Shane said before, I, I really appreciate Shane's name. And we are going to say uh, Shane as many times as we can to be as confusing as possible. Um, it's been great getting to know Shane, and actually the entire uh, the entire search team has just been wonderful. Um, Carrie has done a great job uh, coordinating with me and, and emailing back and forth, making sure that I knew everything that's that's going on. Um, Shane and April hosted us Friday night, and we had a lovely time with them. And Adam and Holly took care of us last night and took us up to to see the snow as it rolled in, and as as my children chased the sheep and. That was just, a, it was a wonderful experience. It was cold and it was snowing. And I, I would, I could tell you now, I hadn't been, I could never be happier uh, than it was at that time. Um, Tom, Nicole, Kendall, a Adam, the other Adam, uh, <laughs> uh, Amanda, uh, all of those folks have been wonderful. I hope I didn't leave anybody out, but, uh, but thank you guys so much uh, for your hospitality and just the work that we've had. So uh, today we're going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verses 19 through 27. And Shane told me I had to preach for 50 minutes. I told him I can't go that long. I'm about a 25 to 30 minute preacher. 
but if you guys want 50, um, I, I can do it again when we get done. <laughs> but uh, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm currently living in Pikeville, Kentucky with my lovely family. My wife is sitting here in the middle. This is Megan. My 16-year-old daughter is on the my left, your right. Her name is Michaela. My son, the middle child, is Micah, and Mary Beth is our youngest, and she walked through the door with us this morning, and I have not seen her since. <laughs> um, if anybody sees my child, let me know. So, uh, but we, Megan and I, grew up in Botetourt County, which is just north of Roanoke, Virginia, and I was raised in a church called Fincastle Baptist Church. When I say I was raised at Fincastle Baptist Church, I was about that size on my first Sunday when I went to Fincastle Baptist. And it, um, at the age of nine, I prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior under a pastor by the name of John Armstead, uh, who later on has uh, baptized me, and he has gone to be with the Lord, but was a big mentor in my life. And that day changed me. Um, and at nine years old, I know this is where pastors are supposed to tell you. And I remember at nine years old, at two o'clock on Thursday, I don't, I didn't get the memo that I was supposed to do that. As we're going through the times that God changed my life, I did not write down the exact moment and times. But anyway, we'll get through it. Um, but I was baptized at that time, made that commitment. And I was a baseball player. Baseball was my sport of choice. Played baseball through high school and on into college. And, uh, you know, was, was privileged enough to play college baseball? Yes, that's right. Somewhere underneath of all this at one time is a finely tuned, chiseled athlete. <laughs> all you college, all you high school athletes right now that weigh 165 pounds, <laughs> guess what I graduated high school at? That's right. When your metabolism stops, it stops. But baseball was my life. Baseball is what I was chasing. It was my one goal. And my senior year at college, Jesus drastically changed my life. I came to the point where I realized I was not living my life for him. That I was living for myself. And even though I knew who Jesus was, that relationship that I needed to have with him was was definitely dusty and tethered. And it was my senior year, and I was a super senior. That means it took me five years to graduate college, where it took everybody else four. Um, I graduated college and knew that God had called me into full-time ministry. I was privileged enough to go back to Fincastle Baptist Church, where I became an intern. And uh, I interned for one month, and the youth pastor left, and I became the youth pastor. And was there for seven more years. In that seven years, I uh, reunited with somebody that I had known through elementary school, which was my wife, Megan. Um, we now have, again, three kids. And um, I've had the privilege of serving in Virginia, in Gadsden, Alabama, and currently in Pikeville, Kentucky. And again, when God called me into the ministry, I couldn't tell you the exact thing that I read in my Bible that day. But I do know... That, that when I submitted to that call, the words that I long to hear when this life is over is well done, my good and faithful servant, which we see recognized in Matthew 25, verse 21. But the scripture that we're looking at today is really what has spoken to me, and I've tried to design my entire ministry around it. And Paul is, is writing this letter to the church at Corinth, and this is the time in church history where we're starting to see the church grow. We're starting to see it take off. And here in 9, verse 19, we're going to read through. It says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law. Though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win 
those outside the law. To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives a prize? Run so that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body, keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should not be disqualified. You know, when we read these verses, there's so much in here. But if there's one thing that I would say today, if there's one thing that I think we need to take away as we leave here today, is that we need to remember we do all things for the sake of the gospel. Everything we do is for the gospel. There's tons of other scriptures that we can go to where it talks about everything you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all for the glory of Christ. Our main thing is to do that, to live every day for the gospel. How do we do this? I love how Paul begins opening up here and he talks about becoming all things to all people. And the number one way that we can reach people for the gospel is that we serve people. We serve them. You know, when you look in Webster's Dictionary under what a servant is, it says a person who performs duties for others to meet their needs. You know, we all have opportunities to be servants. Every day, we have the ability to serve somebody. You know, we see Jesus meeting the physical needs of people all the time. From washing the feet of his disciples to healing people to uh, healing the blind man, to um, curing the deaf, to healing the leper. Jesus continually meets physical needs. So naturally, we'd have to ask ourselves, how do we meet needs? We do whatever it takes to reach people. I know that sounds completely simple. I know that seems like the obvious answer. I don't seem like I'm breaking new ground here as I say we do whatever it takes to reach them. One of my favorite uh, kind of old time pastor stories, which I think uh, I thought when I went to seminary that they were going to hand me a book and it was going to say, hey, here are all of the jokes. Here are all of the stories that you are allowed to tell. Because every pastor that I know tells this story and it's not mine. And I tell you who it is, but I, I don't know if anybody knows. But it's the story of this young man that comes to a church one Sunday morning, and the church is packed. It's full of people. There's not a place to sit. The guy looks kind of dirty, kind of tattered. He walks down front. There's no place to sit, and he sits on the floor. Well, this is a very traditional church, and they begin to get up tight, and they begin to look at this boy, and they're, they're thinking, who is he sitting on the floor at our church? Why would he think he could come in here and sit? Just on the floor. Doesn't he know he should have wore his best clothes to church? Well, then finally, the elderly deacon stands up in the back of the church. And you know, all the people start talking. Oh, he's going to get him. He's going to tell him. He's, they're going to tell this young whippersnapper what to do. And the old man with his cane walks down front. And he takes a seat beside this young man. Begins to worship with him. Because while that deacon didn't know who this boy was. He knew this boy needed Jesus. He knew the best way for him to get Jesus was to begin to develop relationships with strong Christians. And that man met him where he was, sitting on the floor, instead of expecting him to get up. You know, Philippians 2, 4 says, Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but to the interest of others. One of the easiest ways we can serve other people is to simply look around. The person at work, we can help make their job a little easier. That's how we begin to serve them. Working with teenagers, I, I know COVID may be a little different as some of you go back to school, but uh, 
parents, you might not relate to this, teenage boys, especially middle school boys, there's this unspoken rule that even though we're all sitting at the same table, we're all going to the same trash can, I am not going to take your milk carton off of your tray to the trash can for you, even though I'm heading there anyway with the extra two ounces you're going to add. I'm not taking up anybody else's trash. No. But if we humble ourselves and do things as simple as take up the trash for our friends. You know, um, one of the things that I enjoy doing, being the son of a police officer, uh, I love the opportunities when I'm in a restaurant and there's a police officer that's getting ready to, to order and, and I buy their meal. Um, it's not much. It's, it's, but whenever they look and say thanks, it's, it's always, man, thank you guys so much for your doing. I just want you to know Jesus loves you. And, and this is just an opportunity I want to, sh- I want to take to let you, let you know that we appreciate you. We can meet those needs. We can meet those needs by praying for them. You know, there's a lot of people that come into your sphere of influence that the best way we can meet their needs is to simply pray for them and pray with them. So often we run into people who are hurting and our natural reaction is to do what we can do physically to maybe fix their wound or fix their need. When the best thing we could do is in that moment, just begin to lift them up in prayer. Begin to show them how much we care about them. To make the phrase, hey, I'm praying for you, not just something that we say as Christians to pass through, but something that we actually mean. And when we look at somebody and say, I'm praying for you, that they know they're hitting their knees at night, praying for me by name and my situation. Often, Again, we've talked about meeting physical needs from food, clothing, and shelter. And sometimes we just need to meet people's emotional needs. You know, sometimes people just need a friend. And as most of us in here, as men, can attest to, sometimes the number one thing we can do to meet the needs, especially of our wives, is to stop talking and listen. Maybe I'm the only person in this room that has that issue. And when my wife is trying to tell me what's wrong, I want to talk. And she's like, shh, no, my turn, you quiet, shh. And I have to, I have to be quiet. Adam, I do, I I am loud. So I apologize in advance if, if I uh, get too loud. So one of the other things that we talk about is whose needs do we need to meet? One of the first places that we should look at to meet the needs are the needs of our family. You know, for us as parents, that's why we need to meet the needs of our kids. Now, let me stress, children who are now looking at their parents going, yes, you need to meet my needs. The new Xbox is not a need. The new car, not a need. Your new iPhone, definitely not a need. Those are wants. We'll talk about that some other time, the difference in needs and wants. But we meet our kids' needs by making sure that they have clothing, they have food to eat, they have a place to live. We meet the needs of our parents. You know, as kids, when we're younger, one of the ways that you meet the needs of your parents is by following the Ten Commandments where it says, honor your mother and your father. I know I was a kid once, I didn't like that one either when the pastor talked about it, but it turns out, The Bible's right. (laughs) Life is a lot easier if we honor our parents. But even in adulthood, we're still to honor our parents. There are certain things that we have to do to take care of them. Even your aunts, your uncles, cousins, etc. Our family are some of the people that are the easiest for for us to meet needs. We also need to meet the needs of our friends. You know, often we find our friends the easiest people to meet the needs of. I don't know why, but it seems like when it's a friend, it's so much easier for us just to drop everything we're doing to help them. It's easier to do that than even for our family. I think for our family, a lot of times we have this, well, they'll be there when we get back. Friends seem to be the easiest, but often we just, we, we want to be the friend that just agrees with them. And a lot of times, one of the ways we meet the needs of our friend is we have to tell them the hard truth. And show them what the Bible's telling them about maybe the decision that they're looking at, the decision that they're making. 
We're to meet the needs of strangers. And probably the hardest of all, we're to meet the needs of our enemies. Proverbs 25, 21 says, if your enemy's hungry, feed him bread. If he's thirsty, give him water. Now, there are many of us in here. There may be somebody that we don't like that we would consider an enemy. The Bible tells us that we're to love them more. You know, we're not to pick out something that somebody has that's wrong and, and walk away from. We're to love everyone. We're to reach everybody for the gospel. As we continue to look through this verse, the next thing that we need to remember is we need to train ourselves. We see in verse 23, it says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. But do you not know that in a race, all runners run? but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable reef, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. We're to go into training. And, you know, as a college athlete, I, I, liked, I liked practice. I didn't like practice as much as games. I wasn't, I wasn't that person. Everybody that was an athlete at some time had that kid on their team that they liked practice and they didn't like games. I never understood that person. Um, I always wanted to play the game. So, but um, even kind of around New Year's Eve, or we all make those New Year's resolutens to, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exercise more. I've made that one probably every year for the last three years. And, and I get hurt every year because <laughs> just because I get hurt. Okay. Apparently I'm prone to injury. Um, I don't, I don't like to exercise anymore. It's not fun. But the general rule with me is if you see me running, you don't need to ask questions. You need to stop and run in the same direction because whatever's coming is big. Kendall's already offered to kill me. He's trying to get me on a bike. He's like, you come up here. We're going to go bike riding. Somebody else offered to go four-wheelers. Kendall, I hate to say it. The offer's looking a little better for four-wheelers. Um, we make those New Year's resolutions, but here's the thing. Training is hard. I mean, like, even when we watch all of the, 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 the Nike commercials where the guy, I have no idea what the guy in the gym takes those ropes and goes, ha, 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 ha. I don't know what that works, but apparently it's really hard because everybody that does that is sweating a lot. Exercise is hard. Training is hard. When I went from being a high school athlete at Lord Botetourt High School to a small Bluefield college, I remember waking up at 6 a.m. and my coach doing what I assumed was trying to kill us by running advice to you athletes. If you feel that you're being called to go play college sports somewhere, might I suggest going somewhere flat? <laughs> because in Bluefield, when they say we're going to run the hill, the rest of the country calls those mountains. <laughs> the hill we ran was a double black diamond snow sled. So when it snowed... Um, if you don't believe me, find anybody that went to Bluefield College. They can point the hill. But exercise is hard. And you know, training and studying God's word, it's difficult. It takes time. But you know, we are to study it. We're to study it daily. Timothy tells us in 2 Timothy uh, 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Sorry, Paul tells us that. Timothy doesn't tell us that. Timothy, Paul is telling Timothy this. But we have to study God's word. We have to get in here. We have to read it. We have to understand what it says so we can rightly handle it. We can rightly deal with it. You know, we can use scripture to combat sin. You know, a lot of times uh, we run into things, and um, my favorite is 
uh, at churches when we ask people, hey, we'd love for you to get involved some way. And we go, well, I'll pray about it. Well, actually, you don't need to pray about that because, see, the Bible tells us where to serve in our local church. So you might need to pray about where you need to serve. But serving as a whole, no, we're all called to serve as Christians in our local church. Don't get mad at me. This is my first day. Get mad at, at, at what the Bible says. It's, take it up with Jesus. Um, but it helps us to combat sin. Some things we don't necessarily need to pray about. We know it's right. We know it's wrong because the Bible tells us. You know, this is the greatest love letter ever written. Every word in this book screams, I love you. Look what I did for you. Now, many of us remember we were growing up and we were dating that uh, we may get a love letter from our, our, our girlfriend at the time. Love letters, for those of you that were born after 2005, was a text message written on paper <laughs> that you actually had to hand to people. And teenage girls uh, from about 2000, you know, from about ever to 2005, they found fancy ways to fold it. Uh, it could look like a little letter. See, some of the, some of the moms in here like going, I remember doing that. It, it had the little pull tab and you'd pull it and they'd open it for 10 minutes and it would be two and three pages long. And then you as a guy wrote a love letter back. It says, the fine vine wraps around the stump. You are my darling sugar lump. Um, we, we write goofy things like that back. And, but when you got that love letter, we read it immediately. You know, my, my daughter, um, she gets on Snapchat and she'll get frustrated if she sends her boyfriend a snap and he leaves her unopened or on open or, or what, whatever the Snapchat thing is that you do that you're not supposed to do. Teenagers, people under the age of 25, you know what I'm talking about, I assume. <laughs> Left on her. <laughs> there we go. I mean, it's, the minute that we get it, we begin to read it. This is the greatest love letter ever written, and we should be desiring to read it daily. You know, if I want to know God more, I need to know what he says. I need to know what he, what he wants. The more I read God's word, the more I get to know who he is. You know, as we're studying, one of the best things we can do is to be involved in some discipleship group. Again, Kendall's trying to get me into the bike riding discipleship group. I love the discipleship part. The bike riding thing could be the stretch. <laughs> Although I do feel if I go bike riding with them, it'll be like, let's go. And they will be gone and I will be like first hill. And I'll be like I was when I was a teenager, have to hop off and push the bike up the hill. <laughs> some of you laugh and some of you can relate. Um, but uh, but, but get, get involved in a group. One of the things that's been so hard about COVID is we've been unable to get together as a country to study God's word together. You know, that's one of the things I'm greatly looking forward to as restrictions are being lifted is us being able to meet back together to study God's word, to get groups of us together and see what he has for us. Again, the no, another way we must train ourselves is we must continue to pray. You know, prayer is our direct line to God. We have an opportunity to talk to the creator of the universe. The one who spoke most everything into existence. Everything was spoken into existence except for people. He took time to mold them and breathe life into them. You know, 1 Thessalonians tells us, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God, Christ Jesus for you. You know, when we pray and we stay connected to the Father, it makes us happier. It allows us to have that joy when we're connected to God. As Christians, we should be some of the happiest people that you ever meet. There's nothing that bothers me more than meeting a Christian who is miserable. You should love Jesus as much as I do. <laughs> no. 
See, we know this isn't it. We're connected to God, and we know that even after this this time on earth is gone, we get to spend eternity in glory with him, and that is wonderful and amazing. And we get to take our friends with us if we just simply tell them who he is. And then we must also remember prayer is a weapon as well. Prayer should also be our first option. And, and, and I'll speak uh, for myself. I, and even as a pastor and even been in ministry as long as I have, I still struggle with this. There are still things that happen. And my first reaction is, what can I do to fix the problem? If you, if you get to know me, you will understand. There are people that have this construction gene. I can hand you wood. You can build a house. I do not have that. I have the destruction gene. My mom used to say all the time, Shane could tear an anvil up with a toothpick and a toothpick's optional. My son has inherited this gene. But prayer is a weapon. And a lot of times, instead of me trying to fix something that I am not capable of fixing, the first thing I should do is begin to ask God for prayer, is begin to ask God in prayer for help. And for guidance, I look back at my life and think about how it's a lot like listening to your mother. Many of us, if we thought back, if we would have listened to our mom and dad in high school, life would have been so much easier. Prayer is the same way. If we would listen to what God is telling us, our life would be so much easier. I could give you story after story of things that I was trying, things that I did, things that failed. We tried this, it didn't work. We tried this, it didn't work. We got so fed up, we went, ah! let's pray. And we pray, and then, like, God handled it. Now, listen, with prayer, I want to be crystal clear. Praying about it doesn't mean he gives you what you want. Praying that God gives me a million dollars doesn't mean he's going to give you a million dollars. What prayer does, it allows us to seek his will, his direction, his guidance for our life and for our situation. Praying for his path and his will to be done. Another way we must train is we need to fellowship together. I love that. I love spending time in fellowship. Um, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good words, not neglecting to meet together as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, we're to meet with other believers. One of the things that COVID has done to the church across the country is it's made it easy for people to not want to meet together. Listen, I understand. This is a real disease and people are scared. And we should take precautions. And if you're at high risk, I encourage you, get the shots and and do everything that you need to do to be safe. But we need to look forward to that day when we can fellowship with other Christians. I'm so encouraged by how many of us are in this room right now, fellowshipping together, being together, worshiping together. And we need to continue to do that as we go forward. You see, when we meet together as the church, we can lift each other up. We can understand what our needs are. We can pray for each other. Lastly, we need to share the story. Now, see, I began today telling you about my story. But here's the great thing. It's not really my story. Because, see, the story is actually about Jesus. Because my life is drastically different. If at nine years old, I never met Jesus Christ, made him my Lord and Savior. It changed everything from the people that I dated in high school and in college to the woman that I married to how I raised my kids to the people that I come in contact with. We're called to share our story. 
were called to share the gospel, the story of Jesus. Matthew 28 tells us to go and make disciples. It's not any clearer. It doesn't say pastors go make disciples. It doesn't say church leaders go make disciples. It says we're all to go make disciples of all nations. It's why we're to go on foreign missions. It's why we're to do local missions. It's to why we're to look at the places that we work and, and look at that as a mission field. I, I met with somebody earlier today, and, and I won't call them out because I don't want to embarrass them, but they could show me in their Bible where they had been meeting with people and sharing the gospel. And I think there were seven or eight people that they've met with that they wrote their names down that they had the honor and privilege of seeing come to the Lord because they simply shared their story. And that's what we're here for. We need to understand, you know, there are a lot of reasons why we may say we don't want to share our story. Most of the time when I talk to people and and I ask them, you know, what is the biggest thing that you deal with and, sharing your faith, they go, well, I just don't know what the Bible says. Well, funny thing, if we go back to point number two, where we're to train ourselves, if we're training ourselves, then we can't use the excuse, I don't know what to say. You know, we often say we're scared. Well, if we go back to point number two, where when training ourselves, we should be spending time praying that God will open those doors and give us the opportunities. We also know that God will tell us that we don't have to be afraid to share the gospel. A lot of times we'll say the time's not right. If COVID has taught us anything, it's that life is precious. And we're here one minute and gone the next. The time is always right to share the gospel. Now, I believe, you know, there are times in in life when people are more receptive to it. But I begin sharing the gospel with them the day I meet them. Begin sharing my story. Begin talking to them. Developing relationships. So that maybe comes that time when I can look at them and let them know, Romans 3.23, that all man has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, we all continue to sin. All of us will continue to make mistakes. All of us will continue to, to fall. But we can have eternal life through Jesus Christ. Because God so loved the world, he sent his only son. That whoever so believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And all we must do is to call upon the name of the Lord and build that relationship with him. And we can spend eternity with him. And the kicker is we must do whatever it takes. I'm a firm believer in the message never changes. The message of Jesus will never change. But the methods we use to reach people for the gospel are continually changing. We'll do whatever it takes. If it takes people coming into a church and breaking boards with their head to get your friend to come to meet Jesus, then we'll do it. If we have to go out, which I would submit after COVID, that's going to be a lot. We've got to go to people, do whatever it takes to share the gospel with them. Maybe as simple as maybe a a senior couple in the area that needs the light bulbs changed in their house and the batteries and the smoke detectors changed. Maybe you're six foot five and don't even need a ladder to do that. And you're not like me who has to find somebody tall to reach everything. It's the only advantage I have in my house is that I am the tallest one. I don't quite break six feet, but to them, I am a giant. (laughs) Right up until the boy hits a growth spurt, then I won't be a giant anymore. But But we have to go. We have to get into our community and reach people for the gospel. We do whatever it takes. So our action points for today as we close. That we need to ask ourselves is, are we serving others daily? 
is can we look at our lives and see where are we meeting the needs of people? Two, are we spending time training every day? And listen, I get it. It's difficult. Life happens. And I'd encourage you in that training time, pick a time during the day where you know that nobody will interrupt you and you can have that time. For some of us, we need to sacrifice 20 or 30 minutes of sleep. We need to get up earlier. We need to go to bed a little later. We don't need to watch whatever that TV show we're watching. And when it comes to making time, my favorite people to talk to, teenage boys are a wonderful demographic for everything. Dad, I don't have time to read my Bible. You flip on that Call of Duty thing where it says time playing and it says you've been playing for like 47 days. Let me tell you where your time was, son. Fortnite doesn't have that. Wish it did. It does. It brings me joy to see the teenager that goes, I don't have time. You were on Xbox at 2 a.m. until now. You had time. Sit out one game and study your Bible. If we look hard enough, we can find time. Um, one of the things that, that I've enjoyed um, that I missed when we moved to Pikeville, and Pikeville, we walk everywhere because walking from the stage to the door is farther than my house is from the church I currently serve at. But every other church I've been in, I've loved driving to work and taking that time to listen to uh, maybe a Christian podcast or um, that Bible app you that, that we were advertising to go to, it will read it to you. It's pretty cool. I know, it, it, little things in life <laughs> blow my mind. <laughs> Being able to hit the play button on the, on the app so that it'll read it to me going down the road. Those are ways that we can find time. And lastly, who are we sharing the gospel with? Who's the person right now that you know you need to share the gospel with? Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, as we leave this place, help us to remember that everything we do is for the sake of the gospel. Help us to find opportunities to serve others, to train daily, and to share the story of your son. Lord, we love you. We need you. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and bow our heads once again. Um, the Bible says in Romans 10, it says, If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Then in Verse 13, anybody who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So right now, as Pastor Shane gave the message, um, if there's someone out there maybe watching or someone out there listening in the audience today, if you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, today would be a perfect day to do that. You can start fresh, brand new today. And so right now, where you're at, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I'm just going to lead you in a simple prayer. And if you mean it with all your heart, you will be saved. That's what the Bible says. So it goes something like this. Lord, I come to you today. I need to be saved. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that he rose again on the third day. The best I know how right now, I give you my heart and my life. Come in and change me forever. Amen. If you did that, or if you made a decision of any kind today, that you can go online. We've got connect cards online. There's connect cards in the very back. Also, as <clears throat> on our way out today, there's buckets in the very back. You can give your tithes and offerings, or you can do that online as well. So, that concludes that. We, we really appreciate you. Um, Pastor Shane, uh, 
uh, really got to know you and your family this uh, last few months. And so <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to give you like a five-minute intermission, okay? We're going to dismiss five-minute intermission, give the visitors uh, an opportunity to leave, and we appreciate every visitor that comes. And we, we really, as CLF, we, we thank you for coming today. For give you a little bit of heads up, what's going to happen is the Carr family, they are going to leave this morning with the visitors. So we just tell them you appreciate them. And then a members who, are, who is left, um, if you are high school or above, we're going to vote on, on Pastor Shane and his family as our next pastor, okay? So that's what's going to happen. So as I speak, you got about five minute intermission, okay? We are so glad you joined us today. If you made a decision or have a prayer request, be sure to complete the connect card at the link on the screen to share those with us. For those that call CLF home, ways for you to give can be found on the screen. For those in person, giving buckets can be found on the tables as you exit the auditorium. For those of you joining us in person, we ask that you remain seated and our ushers will guide you to the exit. We look forward to seeing you again next week.